Hardy, Hardy's not here, Hardy here, Hardy, <laughs> Stevens, Rots, Barry, Steinhubble, I only call people that I saw come in, so because some people come dragging in late. And... All right, we were working on welded connections. We had analyzed quite a few of them. Now then, we're going to design one. Got A36 steel plates. This one is similar to the problem we had in example 712. Here's what it looked like. Had wells on the sides only. Look on page 447, you'll find it. Had an axial load P on a plate welded to a gusset plate. <clears throat> Got to have a dead load of 9 service, live load of 18 service, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. How long must a set of quarter-inch fillet wells B, if you're going to use the appropriate rod for A36 steel, the E70 rod, has a tensile strength equal to Lahog, what's the tensile strength of a E70 rod? Lahog, I'm sorry? But a molecule, no, not a molecule. This is not a chemistry class. L-A-H-A-U-G. Yeah, that's loud. Oh, golly, I guess you didn't even recognize that, huh? <laughs> All right, let me... La Hague? Is that... Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I can do this probably. Lucas, how's that sound? Okay, and I'm just Lee. Okay, that'll work. How much tensile stress does an E70 rod have? Yeah, it's E70XX, actually. Now I see why you were delaying the inevitable. <laughs> 50, very good. Add a little to that, though. Uh, how much? You go a little higher than that. Yeah, all right, 70 KSI. That's right. That's why they gave it that name. Okay, you say, what are you picking on me for? I wasn't talking, it was them over there, those girls. Say, yeah, well, but if you can't pick on girls, it's not politically correct, so. <laughs> People with names you can't pronounce, they're next on the list. Assume that both parts are three-eighths of an inch thick, so whether it tears through the gusset or through the plate, I don't know, don't care. Yes, sir. I don't know. I don't remember. I think you can look that up. 18 or 14. No, I don't think there's any of those. It signifies what? No, no. This pretty well tells us the alloy right here. The coating razor. But we don't care. That's how come nobody knows. That's how come you don't know. Yeah, well, no, they don't want to be curious in here. No, no, no. Gets you in trouble. All right, so now this one I know nobody's going to get. Let me pick somebody at uh, random here. A car? Yes, I was just talking. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you noticed that, huh? All right. So the shear strength per weld is 1.392 times dead. Now, if you say, well, I don't remember where that came from. It came from page 450 where we decided our life might be easy, made easy, if we'd find out if we were going to use E70 rods, because they're the most common rods that we use <coughs> for A992 and A36 steel both, we go ahead and multiply the, the throat 
size of a 1 16th inch leg size weld times one inch and just see how strong a 1 16th inch weld was. And then if we happen to have a 3 16th weld, we would just take the strength of a 1 16th inch weld. Since we have three of them, we just multiply it times three to get the strength per inch. So in our case, we have a 4 16th inch weld. So that's a good number to hang on to. Write it somewhere in your user's manual or your uh, LRFD manual. 1.392 times 4 gives us 5.568 kips per inch of strength for one inch of weld. And we, of course, got a whole lot of load to hold up. We got 9 dead and 18 live. <clears throat> comes from the equation on page 7.34a, page 450. In the shear yield strength of the base metal, we had the same idea. It wasn't quite as nifty because in this case, assuming you're going to use an E70 rod, all we didn't know was the size of the weld, and you're probably either going to pick that or solve for it. On the base strength in yield and rupture for the base plate, we don't know what plate you're going to use, as well as we don't know how thick the plate is. So it becomes a little less useful, but still worthwhile. It's going to be six tenths. In our case, it's A36 steel, so the uh, tension, tension yield is 36. That makes it shear yield. And the plate is three eighths of an inch thick, both of them, so I don't care which one you're talking about. That's the base metal. That one's going to be 8.1 kips per inch. <clears throat> and it really doesn't matter if uh, we were talking about putting how strong these things are down around each one of these holes where we weld things or where we bolt things down. You can't have more strength on any one inch of this weld than the weakest thing. So if you say, well, once this weld gets on back to the end of the plate back there, it'll have 1.5 times the strength because it's 90 degrees with respect to these wells. I'm saying I don't care. If you have a strength on this inch of base plate and a strength on this inch of base plate and a strength on this inch of weld, you must take the lowest of those in that weld. So the strength due to yielding along the base metal was a 3 8 inch plate, 8.1 kips per inch, and the strength with the shear rupture, you're going to be able to up that number to uh, 58 for A36 steel, but you're not going to be able to use as high a fee value. The fee value on this one, if you remember, was 1, so that drops the 0 0.6 down to 0 0.45, even though you raise the 36 up to 58. Now, if you say, well, this one always seems to control when we just do it, well, you're going to have some metals that that doesn't happen. It's going to be that this number is pretty close to this number, and then when you apply the fee factors to them, then you'll find out this one takes over. So you just have to check them both. So, so far, we have 5.568 kips per inch due to the weld, 8.1 kips per inch due to yielding the base metal, and 9.7 due to rupturing the base metal, so we're going to have to take the lowest of those three. Then um, 39.6 kip. Somebody calculated how much load we were going to have to have on that thing when I wasn't looking. Uh, there it is, 1.2 dead of 9 plus 1.6 live of 18, 39.6 kips. We have the strength of our weld is controlled by the 5.568, and so I can tell you how long the weld has to be. 39.6 kips divided by kips per inch. This is assuming there's no weld on the end. Did he tell us that? Yeah, he did. If you remember, the original problem had weld on the sides only. So he's not in that dilemma. Should I take the 1.5 and only get a piece of these? What, how much piece did you get on these? One, no. You got one, one, one if you had end wells, and you were willing to live with one, one, one. But if you wanted to, you could take this one times one and a half. But then these had to be cut down by 
How much? 15% down. That was a 0.85. That's correct. Take your choice. And you got the larger of the two, which is an unusual gift, but true. That doesn't apply to us. We don't have an end weld. So you need 7.11 inches. They're probably going to round it up to 7.5, maybe 8 inches, 4 inches on each side. No matter what they do, when they only put 4 inches down this length, somebody's going to have to go back and check this plate because this thing here may have a U of 0 or a U of 0.75 or there are several U values in there depending on how long is the weld and how far are they apart. If to scale this thing is drawn like this, there's your 4 inches and there's your 4 inches, you're not going to get much load out of that. That load's going to have too hard of a time getting through those little 4-inch wells. Did he tell us what that distance was? I don't remember. He may have. But it still has to be checked. Yes, <clears throat> ASD, no thank you. Practical design of welded connections, consider, I'm sorry, did I miss the very end of it? This one? Okay, we got the 7.11. Said, see, he was going to use 8. I was thinking that you could... Uh, Going to have to have four inches on each side. I was thinking that he could use, well, he really can't, can he? Three and a half on each side, three and a half, three and a half, that's only seven, so that wouldn't work. So round it up to the nearest inch, that's eight inches total, four inches on each side. All right, practical design requires a consideration of things like, you already knew this, minimum, maximum well sizes, short lengths, long lengths, the whole nine yards, we already covered that. And we discussed it by looking at the, uh, the AISC, uh, the LRFD, no, the specs. They were listed in J22B. They're on this page in our notes. They're on that page in the text. A quick summary. They can't be too small. Nebel. Nebel. You're right next to the other guy. I can't pronounce his name. Okay. <laughs> and you both got the name Taylor. Well, what am I going to do about that? Okay. Nibel. What, why is the minimum size a restriction? Do you happen to remember? I mean, okay. Well, it's not unusual. This stuff goes pretty fast. Graham, you remember? Graham here? Graham, you remember? You don't remember something? Say the word heat. Very good. Heat. That's right. Clark? Where's Clark? What kind of heat? What's wrong with heat with little bitty wells? Do the little bitty wells get hot when they lay them down in the fillet down in the corner there? Yes, they do. That's good. Wells get hot. Cantu. Where's Cantu? Barry. Never mind. Brown. I picked on Barry. Brown. Brun. Brown. Brun. Well, they get hot, and if they're little bitty wells down in that corner, those little corners just suck the heat out of them like crazy. Didn't we discuss that? You could, and if you're willing to do that, then this probably won't matter. And then you're going to let the whole thing cool off nice and slow. But that's not cheap. So you know, there's a minimum size, and the, and the specs let you get away with it if you want to do it, but then you've got to preheat the metal. Maximum size. Well, they don't want the thing to be too big because you burn a corner off this and I won't have a way to inspect it up to a little less than a quarter inch. At a quarter inch, you've got to leave me some corner. A little less than a quarter, they don't think you'll cheat. They don't think you'll just burn a corner off out of carelessness that you probably can develop that weld successfully. Minimum length, they couldn't be too small. Maximum length, they couldn't be too large. On end loaded wells, minimum length by that I mean too short. Um, here was the factor that you had to go by. 
if you were going to have an end loaded weld, here's an end loaded weld. I have that. I'm talking about here's the load, the weld, and it's loaded on the ends. If you have an end loaded weld, it takes a while for these loads to get out way on down here. If this is 100 inches down here, you got to have a whole bunch of stretch in this well before the member can deform to get load on down the road here. So they will put limitations on how long they can be. Past 300 times the well size, forget it. You can put all you want down there. You're not getting any more 180 times the well size. Discusses end returns. A lot of times it's just to make sure that the weld has an appropriate size all the way down to the end. You can count that in some cases. Cost. Well, here is a quarter inch weld, for example, and somebody needed twice the throat. And so rather than making this a quarter, they made it a half inch weld. In changing it from a quarter to a half inch weld, they multiplied the volume times one, two, three, cost them four times the cost. It's a direct cost of the volume uh, laid down in the groove there. Cost them four times the volume or the cost as you got out of added strength. It's twice as strong, four times as much money. Another example, got a half by four A36 plate tension member. Got six dead, 18 live. Going to be attached to a three eighths. Okay, right off the bat, are these both A36? Yeah. Uh, this is the one that will tear. So when we're calculating the base metal shear, it's going to shear right along the edge of the weld probably, uh, either all the way around or if it's just got welds on the sides next to that. Wants to design a welded connection. Base metal, say 36, E70 rods. Somebody at random here. But I can't find him. Guess so much for the word random, huh? Taylor. Taylor? What does this right here mean? Last name. The other, the other Taylor. I'm sorry? Your last name isn't Taylor? Your first name been Taylor? Your dad's name been Taylor? Your mom's name is Taylor. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, gee, that's uh, too bad. I thought you... Oh, I bet, I know what I was looking when I was looking at the other guy's name. Somebody next to him had the name Taylor. Okay. You. Yeah, you. What does this right here mean? Good. It has a tensile strength of 70 KSI. That's correct. There, if that's true, then what is the shear strength? Because this thing is does fail in shear. Well, no, because steel is usually weaker in shear than tension. You remember the number by how much? You needed to see if your name was Smith, you wouldn't be having these problems. <laughs> I didn't say everyone Taylor wasn't having the problem. Vickers, where's Vickers? Ta Taborga, Tidwell, yeah. look at this, you're the first out of three people, even Mitch, you're here. Uh, do you remember, I don't remember the question, yeah, point six. very good, I, look at that, she got the question and the answer, that's right, six tenths is strong. All right, minimum size, why are they going to use the minimum size, Davila, they're going to use the minimum size. I'm sorry? Well, it is a place to start. That's not fair. Casey, what other reason would there be to start with a minimum size weld? Cheaper. It's cheaper. That's right, because it's a smaller weld. We just noticed if you double the size of the weld, you double its strength, but you four times its price. So the guy says, well, why don't we make them as small as we can? Can't make them any smaller than the minimum, or you'll suck all the heat out of it, and it'll crack. Or you'll have to preheat the plate. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so he's going to start with a minimum. Now, what is the downside of making this weld a minimum size? Bowman? 
Don't know. I don't either, but I'm going to ask that I get an answer. Forrester? Forrester not here? Gamble? Gamble? How to do a much longer well, which makes the connection much longer. Now, if it makes it too much longer, well, then it just won't be reasonable because you spent up all your money <clears throat> in making this plate longer. So we're going to have to hit a happy medium of some kind. So we'll start off trying a minimum size weld. Going to use these 70 rods. The design strength is 1.392 times some magic number of sixteenths of inch you're willing to purchase. You decided to purchase three of them sixteenths. What's going on here? Ooh, that's a mistake. Oh, yeah. It says here, right there, doesn't it? It's 1.392 times 3. I'm not sure if this is still in your book. Sometimes they'll, you know, print little pieces to fix things like that. It may have the same addition number. 4.176 kips per inch. Shear strength of the base metal is, for the thinner plate, uh, 0.6, F sub Y T, 0.6, yield of A36, Thickness of the plate, 3 8 8.1. This guy's controlling so far. The shear rupture strength is 0.45 times the change in the 0.6 to a lower number because this had a 1 in it for fee. This one had a 0.75 in it for fee. This one had a 36 for yield. This one had a rupture of 58 times 3 8 so these are the same numbers we saw before because they were still 3 8 inch plates. This is going to control, and it usually does. They usually have the, the if, they, if the well doesn't control, there's not much reason to make the well that big because you're not getting your money's worth out of it. You might as well make it smaller if you can. So we're going to go on the 4.176. I'll say the well strength governs. Factor load, 1, 2 dead, 1, 6 live, 36. Required length, 8.62. Minimum length, I don't think that's going to control, do you think? That's 4 times 3 sixteenths. Can't be any less than 3 quarters of an inch. That very seldom controls. And that is less than ours. Ours is going to be one on each side, 4.31. Oh, got a couple errors here. And so we have not violated the minimum length we can make them uh, 4.31 on each side four and a half inch long for a total length of nine inches uh, for this type of connection he says side wells must be at least as long as the transverse distance between them that was because if you have something that looks like that uh, this weld here and this weld here, if these weld links are shorter than the distance between them, he doesn't even give you a U. You're lucky to get a zero. And so you get no strength at all. And so since they're at least as long as this width is, he says we can work with that. Uh, that may take quite a toll on the strength of this plate. So you'll have to check the plate. He hadn't checked the plate at all as of yet. We gotta check all kinds of goodies on it. So far as the well's concerned, three sixteenths fillet weld, E seventy rods, total length of the four and a half inches on each side as shown somewhere. Uh, volume proportional across the weld. True. If you use a three sixteenths inch weld to carry a hundred kips of factored load. There's your 1.392 dead. There's 1.392 kips print for every sixteenth of inch of weld for a three sixteenths weld. Give you this load. We already figured that out. So the length of the weld necessary, 100 kips over that. If you use a three quarter inch weld uh, using E70 rods to carry 100 kips, it'll have to be 24 inches long. Volume of the weld, base times height times a half times length. 0.421 cubic inches. That sure isn't a lot of cubic inches, is it? And using a 4 sixteenths well to do the same thing, you'd have a 1.392 dead 4 sixteenths. Instead of having a 4.1, you get 5.568. Now then the well length can be shorter. 
It's only 17.96 inches long. Base times height times a half. That's the end area times the length. 0.561 cubic inches. You just caused an increase in the volume of weld. 33% added volume to pick up the same load. And I don't know why somebody didn't figure out how much more it cost. Well, I guess it cost 33 cost 33% more, didn't it? Oh, it cost 33% more, and you didn't get any added load capacity at all. Still got 100 kips of load capacity. That's how come we like little welds. You're buying. You're buying. I'm not sure it's six, because if you just took the difference in these two, there's probably one on each side. And so there'd be three inches shorter connection. That's correct. Now, once the connection gets to be uh, 87 inches long, well, then we got problems with little welds. We're going to have to step it up. Weld symbols, just so you know what they look like on the plans. This little weld-looking thing is near to me, and therefore it says weld on the near side. I want to use a quarter-inch weld, six inches long. This would say on the other side. So if you were going to weld back here, then you would point to this line and you would say weld it on the other side. If you're going to weld it on both sides all the way around, then you would show the little weld on both sides and give the links. If you don't want to do all that, you just say I want that size weld, that means all the way around. If you're not going to use the normal rod that they're expecting, then you'll put what rods you want them to use. You can put all kinds of little things in that tail. Uh, that means you're going to do it in the field. This probably means you're going to do it in the shop. And they have thousands more to tell you everything. Got another example. A one-eighth inch thick, eight inch wide, quite a wide plate, of A36 steel, uses a tension member to be connected to a three eighths inch gusset plate. That's that thick, that's that thick. Gusset plate controls tearing of the base material, as shown next page. Length, oops, can't exceed eight inches. Okay, that's probably going to influence how small a weld we can put on it. As far as that goes, we'll probably just go ahead and solve for the size of the weld since he's going to give us the length. All welding must be done on the close side, the near side. Can't weld that little back piece. Design a weld to get the full capacity of the member. Uh, uh, well, I don't know, to tell you the truth. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. So if I said, well, it's no longer max, and so I shorten that down to six, then this would be six, and that would be six, and this would be longer than the distance between them. You can do that. You just get no strength out of it. U is zero. So you say, well, why do it? Obviously, you wouldn't do it. Now, this guy, I don't know what the use of one here. You know, I don't know if he's going to be a one here unless you put a weld across the end of this thing. Maybe that's what he plans on doing. If he does, then from somewhere down in here, he told me that, and I stuck you as one up there. Design strength, going to be based on gross section yield, going to be based on net section rupture. On gross section yield, we've got to go back to page 8 in the book. Nine tenths F sub Y area gross, uh, feed point nine, A thirty six steel, half inch thick, eight inches wide, one hundred twenty nine kips. No reason to make a weld any stronger than that number so far. How strong is it based on its effective area? He says if the welds are going along the sides only, we got to go get U. Then there's you know some question about what U would be. However, if there's also a weld on the end, then area effective is area gross because you didn't lose this little piece of metal on the end. He says, and let's assume the latter. Okay, so we got a weld on the end. U is 1.
You could also be one, depending on how long the wells were. If the wells were long enough, this 8-inch would be okay if you didn't have the weld on the end. So for uh, F sub U instead of F sub Y, and a 0.75 instead of a 0.9, gross area, 0.75, 58 for A36 steel, half inch thick, 8 inches wide, 174 kips, could care less. Still not going to design my well to carry any more than this. Incidentally, when I design my wells, uh, somebody has already factored the load. So I want, my, I want my wells also factored when I do the design. In other words, if you've got well numbers running around loose where they say R subnominal is equal to so many kips per inch, I don't want to be. I don't want you to be using that. I want you to go ahead and have a fee times R sub n per inch because you've already got the fee in here. Now, if you want to take the fee out of this calculation, then uh, then you can design the wells based on their nominal strength, but it has to match up. So we're going to go for 129 kips with E70 rods. Table J24, this page, tells you the minimum size is 3 16 However, he says because of the length restraint, we're going to go ahead and try a slightly larger weld, quarter-inch weld. Okay. Uh, the design strength or the factored strength, that's got the fee in it already. You're going to try a quarter-inch well, 4 sixteenths, 5.568. Checking the base metal shear. No new numbers here because there's still three-eighths of A36 steel, 8.1 and 9.7. The weld controls. There's both longitudinal transverse welds are going to be used. Want to know how long the longitudinal welds are. These are these length welds. It says let's try both of those options. First, assume the same strength, 100%, 100%, 100% for everybody in sight. Well, 8 inches of this strength weld would take out 8 times that number and leave us with some load to be carried by the side wells. Uh Total length of the weld required was 23.28. Taking 8 inches out of the total of 23 that we need <coughs> leaves us with about 8 inches <coughs> on each side. So probably going to be using 888 if we just count 100%, 100%, 100%. For the second option, you're going to get only 0.85 of the 5.5. But you're going to get 150% of the 5.5 on the ends. So 150 to 5.5 gives you 8 KS kips per inch on the ends. You need 126 kips minus you're going to give me 8.35 per inch on the ends. So the difference is 67, 62.7 for the two sides. That's left for the sides. And the required length of the longitudinal wells, total load divided by, yeah, that's right, so there's the 4.47. Half of the load goes on one side, half of the load goes on the other side. Here's the strength of each side per inch, 6.63 inches. Now, I don't know if we've got a problem here. Uh, because all of a sudden now we don't have this thing here. We got this, and this is only six. I mean that's nicer. I'd rather have seven inches. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ask that welder to do a six point six three inch weld. He'll stick a rod up my nose. Seven inches. This is eight. Is that going to cause some eyebrows to be raised? No. That's correct. Why not? Because you have a transverse weld. 
I mean, uh, no question. We've been so busy making sure that this distance across here wasn't shorter than these wells because then without that there, we had a U of zero. But as long as we have this across the end, all of these little people can get out these doors. And these can get out these doors very gracefully. There's nobody running over like crazy. Like if there's no weld on the end, all trying to get out the side doors and bunching up and causing a U to be less than one. So that's okay. Still got all the old friends to calculate. Block shear in the thinner plate. I won't bother that same old, same old. Add a block shear strength with an upper limit of. Design strength turned out to be bigger than our uh, gross section yield on the plate itself, and our wells were bigger, higher strength than that, so we're good to go. Loud stress design. Hey, you would, if the wells were a higher strength, you would pay a little more for the higher strength rod. You have to make sure you keep track of who's got one and where they're at. Make sure they're putting them on the right connection. Probably the guy's going to say, look, unless you're going to use those different rods on the third floor and above, I don't want them just over in the ballroom and over in the so-and-so because I don't know my guys will be that careful. No, no, block shear turned out to be a number higher than uh, gross section yield. Block shear, once you got it all said and done, 287, and then times fee still was 216. This was our gross section yield. That's the limit. There's not much you can do with that. That's just flat based on the yield of the plate. I'm sorry? I don't think so. I think the 196 was... Way back from day zero. See, that was back when we first found the gross area and gross section yield. Then we designed the wells so that they would not fail, so we at least get the full strength of our plate. All right. <clears throat> now, those are simple connections. A simple connection is one where the resultant of the load goes through the centroid of the bolt group or the centroid of the weld group. So if you have a weld on an angle, here's an angle, and you will find, we'll talk about it later on, that sometimes it's to your advantage to make that weld longer than this weld because the centroid of the angle is here, looking at it from the end, so you put, the, so you don't get eccentricity in it. Um, don't know why I told you that. And then here's the load coming down the centroid of the angle, and then the centroid of the wells matches with the centroid of the angle. That's why. Uh, that is now still a simple connection. But if you say, yeah, well, I don't think the code really or the specs say that. I'm going to put six inches well, put six inches well, and I'm going home. You put your load wherever you dang well please. Well, then that is a. Then that is not a simple connection, because the centroid of your weld group, six inches, six inches, is in the middle. Here is your load off by two inches. That is not a simple connection. That's an eccentric connection. You may not have to handle it. The specs may say, that's okay, reasonable, and other times they'll say that's too far. You must take into account the moment caused by that force times that eccentricity. So if you have a load here at the center of something and then the wells are like this because you can't get to that side, that's okay. You can do that. We do it all the time. But you will have to admit, first you'll pick up the load P and you'll put it at the centroid and you'll distribute that load P uniformly across the entire connection and then you'll have to come back once that's finished and put a bending moment, P times E, and handle that moment part on the connection. More generally, that's done when you have a plate that looks like this. 
welded to a column and you just weld it and the load's out here. Then you'll take that load and you will pretend it's on the centroid of the weld and that all 50 kips comes out in all 10 inches, 50 divided by 10, all the way around. Then you come back and on this weld group, you put a moment. P times E. To handle that part of the load on the connection. Read this. Here are typical connections. These will be bolted for a while. Number one, the bolts are in pure shear. Where you see a number two, they're in shear and in tension. Here is a side view of a beam bolted to a column. Here is the end view of that beam bolted to a column. If you look at these bolts, if you look at these bolts here, and you cut it loose from the column, and you ask what's going on with this angle, there's a shear force acting up on the angle because there's some loads acting down on the beam, and that load is eccentric from these bolts. Since that's the case, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up this force R and I'm going to put it at the centroid of the bolted connection. And I'm going to tell you the force on that bolt is R over 3, R over 3, R over 3. There's that bolt. There's R over 3 on that one. There's not room. There's R over 3 straight up on that one. There's R over 3 straight up on that one. Since this load does not truly go through the centroid of the bolts that we are now analyzing, it's out of distance E. You will have to put a bending moment M. That'll be R times E. R times E clockwise means that it's going to pull on this bolt. It's going to push on that bolt. And it's not going to do anything to that bolt because that bolt is on the centroid of the bolt group. This number was R over 3. This number right here has to keep this thing in equilibrium. Since that moment is equal to R times E, <coughs> then this force multiplied times the bolt spacing plus this force times the bolt spacing, those two, two times the force in shear times the spacing, <coughs> has to cause a moment, R times E. That's how you'll solve for F sub V. F sub B is equal to the reaction force times the eccentricity divided by two times the spacing. That's if there's two bolts. If you got four bolts or eight bolts or 11 bolts, obviously it's a little more complex. The interesting thing is, is when you push this angle up on this girder, you shear the bolts in shear. You load the bolts in shear. You wipe this face across that face and shear the bolts. When you put a moment on this angle, you also wipe the bolts. You push this point right back. You push this point to the left, and you shear the bolt. Therefore, the force in the bolt is R over 3 in shear squared plus this force in shear squared. Take a square root. And these bolts are loaded in, sh these bolts are loaded in shear. Now then, instead of looking at this free body, let's look at the column with the bolt, the bolts attached, where the force R, the same force R that was on the last one, is down through these three bolts. Now we're talking about these people here. First, I'm going to, you see it, I do it all the time, I lie. 
I pick the load up and I put it at the shear plane. In other words, I say E is zero. You say, no, it's not. I say, well, until I say otherwise, right now, it's right there. You say, okay, be that way. Then I'm going to show you a force down on this bolt at this shear plane right here. And that force is R over 3. And there's one on that bolt, and there's one on that bolt, and there's one on that bolt. Now then I'm going to admit that I have a moment that goes this way about this centroid. Its magnitude is R times E. There it is right there. M is equal to R times E. It's going to pull on that bolt. You'll notice it's not shearing the bolt now. On this connection, it's a tension force on that bolt. And this one is compressing the bolt. Now, the truth is it's not compressing the bolt. It's really compressing these two surfaces. But we assume that it's just pressing on the bolt. And since I'm going to design this one for that tension, the fact this one doesn't really have that tension or compression force in it, I don't care. It's really just going to get pure shear still. The force up here is going to have to say T times S plus T times S is equal to R times E. Going to be the same tension force there as we had a shear force here. The problem is I can no longer do this. I can't say that's R over 3. And that's equal to T. I don't know what it is. Whatever it was up here. I can't say that that's... Well, I can say that. And that is what's going on in the bolt. But a minute ago, you could design this bolt for shear, period. Go home. What do you have with, what do you have to do here? What is it? Biaxial, okay. Biaxial sounds about two axes. Give me something else that sounds like two. Interaction equation. It's nastier than biaxial bending. Well, I guess not really, because biaxial bending, you've got an interaction equation. You got to do all that interaction stuff. First, you got to design it for shear, make sure the shear's not too big. Then, then once you do that, you find out if you got any tension left over for you. And then if you got any tension left over for you, you can check it against that force there. So this connection is not the one you want to see on the quiz. This is the one you want to see on the quiz. Now, there's two ways of doing this. One's called is, not called, it is an elastic analysis. Uh, what you do is you take the load and you put it at the centroid of the bolt group and you distribute the load uniformly between eight bolts. Then you take the load times the eccentricity and put a torque on it and you apply a TC over J equation to it. Doesn't exactly fit the real world because TC over J was derived for a solid cylinder, a uh, flat circle, but it's plenty close and it's a little on the safe side. So we will get some forces that go this way and some forces that go due to the twisting. And then we stop the world whenever the first bolt yields. Now, that leaves us with a lot of strength there that we haven't accounted for. Number one, the fact is this bolt can yield. It can go past yield, allowing the next bolt to yield. And then he can yield, and then the next bolt will yield, and the next bolt. And first thing you know, they may not all get to yield because, for instance, to get this one to yield, you might have to roll that plate 50 degrees. So when one of these bolts reaches a real honest-to-goodness max that we have to quit, then we'll quit on the whole thing. But believe me, picking up all these other people's additional capacity is quite uh, an increase in the numbers. So we're going to have an elastic analysis, then we're going to have a plastic analysis. We'll work on those next time. It's getting time to drag your quiz by, since you found that uh, I can't even add right five points to your detriment, you need to bring those up. Pretty soon, a few days.
or if you got cheated in any respect. Thank you.